Hi everyone, my name is Dan and I'm a mental health pharmacist and today I'm going to be doing an in-depth review on the drug aripiprazole with the brand name Abilify. So I do have a short video about this medication that's about a minute or two long, but this is going to be a much more in-depth review. We're going to be covering a lot, so this potentially might be a little bit of a longer video. Uh, feel free to skip through and find the parts that are most important to you. So I'm going to start with just an introduction, then I'm going to go into the dosing, then I'm going to go into the mechanism of action of the medication, then some side effects, including black box warning, including major warnings, and including some of the standard side effects. After that, I'm going to go into each individual indication. So I'm going to start with schizophrenia, which has FDA approvals for this medication. Then I'm going to go into bipolar disorder. Then I'm going to go into depression. Then I'm going to go into irritability associated with autistic disorder then Tourette's disorder, and that will summarize the video today. So quite a few pieces to get through and uh, quite a lot of information. So again, feel free to skip through to the parts that are most important to you. So aripiprazole is a prescription medication in the atypical antipsychotic class. It was developed in Japan um, by the company Otsuka and was approved by the FDA in 2002 for schizophrenia. Since that time, it has gained a lot more approvals, such as bipolar mania, such as an adjunct in depression, um, irritability and autism, Tourette's, and so on. The brand name of aripiprazole is Abilify. Aripiprazole is available as a tablet, an orally disintegrating tablet, an oral solution, and a tablet with a sensor in it called Abilify MySight. So for compliance reasons, it can, the sensor can be tracked to see if the patient is taking the medication. I've actually never seen the Abilify MySight used, but it's important to note from an academic standpoint. Aripiprazole is also available as a long-acting injectable medication. So this means the medication can be given in an uh, IM injection, and that sticks around in the system depending on which injection you use for a month to up to two months. So that a pill doesn't have to be taken every day. There's two long-acting injectable formulations. The first is called Abilify Maintena and the second one is called Aristata. There used to be a short-acting injectable agent for something like acute agitation or something like that, but I haven't seen it used and I and it is no longer available. Even though aripiprazole falls into the antipsychotic class, it has many uses outside of psychosis. So I already touched on this, but just to reiterate, the FDA approved uses of aripiprazole include all of the following. Schizophrenia, acute treatment of manic and mixed episodes of bipolar 1 disorder, adjunctive treatment for major depressive disorder, irritability associated with autistic disorder, and Tourette's disorder. Let's now go into the dosing of aripiprazole. So the dosing of the medication depends on which indication is being treated. In general, schizophrenia and bipolar mania require higher doses, and depression, irritability associated with autism, and Tourette's disorder require lower doses. Also of note, the dosing changes and differs based on the age of the patient. So um, adolescent dosing can be different than adult dosing depending on the indication. So uh, it's important to note that and, and look that up if you're unsure. Just to give you a brief glimpse into it, I'll go through a few of the dosing strategies. So for schizophrenia in adults, the initial dose is between 10 and 15 milligrams with a recommended maximum of 30 milligrams. And let's compare this to major depressive disorder as in adjunct. The initial starting dose is two to five milligrams which with a max, maximum recommended dose of 15 milligrams. So again, it shows for MDD as an adjunct, the dosing starts low and the max is 15. And then something like schizophrenia, the dosing can start at 15 and end at 30 milligrams. Let's briefly cover the dosing of the long-acting injectable agents. So Abilify Maintena has a starting dose of 400 milligrams. It's given 
every four weeks, and there's a 14-day oral bridge or oral overlap when you start the first injection. Aristata has many different dosing strategies you can use. So the initial dose can be 441 milligrams, 662 milligrams, or 882 milligrams every four weeks, or 882 milligrams every six weeks, or 1,064 milligrams every eight weeks. So there's different dosing strategies here rather than just once per month like the Abilify Maintena. That being said, there's a 21-day oral bridge with this, but there is another injection available called Aristata Initio that can eliminate the need for an oral bridge. You just give one 30 milligram tablet, give the long-acting injectable Aristata, and give the Aristata Initio shot as well. How aripiprazole works is not completely understood. It's a complicated molecule that binds to many different receptors in the brain. Aripiprazole is a partial dopamine agonist at the dopamine subtype 2 receptor, often called D2. This was the first partial dopamine agonist of its kind and differs mechanistically from other second gen antipsychotics and from first generation antipsychotics. Since aripiprazole has been approved, there have been two more partial dopamine agonists approved, so brexpiprazole and cariprazine. So although it's a partial dopamine agonist at the D2 receptor, it, off, it also binds to other subtypes of dopamine. This includes D3 and D4. But when it comes to schizophrenia, the D2 receptor is often considered the most important. A partial agonist at D2 receptors means that aripiprazole binds to and activates the receptor to a degree that is less than dopamine, which is the chemical that's supposed to activate this receptor. This means that dopamine's effects will be decreased in areas of the brain where dopamine is high. So if dopamine's a full agonist at the dopamine receptors, giving something like aripiprazole is still an agonist at this receptor, but it's a partial agonist. So it's a, to a lesser degree than dopamine. So giving aripiprazole effectively is decreasing the effects of dopamine. Decreasing dopamine in areas of the brain where dopamine is high, like the mesolimbic pathway, is how we commonly treat symptoms such as delusions and hallucinations. In areas of the brain where dopamine is low, like the mesocortical pathway, aripiprazole will effectively increase the effects of dopamine because if dopamine's low and we give a partial agonist, that's effectively increasing the effects of dopamine. So increasing dopamine in the mesocortical um, pathway can help with things like the negative symptoms of depression. So this differs than, say, a typical or first-generation antipsychotic that's a strong dopamine blocker in all pathways in the brain. So this is a newer, more advanced, more complicated mechanism. So although aripiprazole is a partial agonist at the D2 receptors, it still binds very strong to these receptors. That means it can kick off other molecules from the D2 receptor that are weaker binding, binders. So it may not be the best option to combine with other D2 binding molecules, but we'll talk about that a little bit more in the evidence. To put it in perspective, haloperidol is considered a strong dopamine blocker. It can really take people out of um, hallucinations acutely, that sort of thing. It's, so it's considered a strong binder at the D2 receptor. And it has a Ki constant of 1.4 at the dopamine receptor. Aripiprazole has a Ki constant of 0.45. And the lower that number is, the stronger it's binding. So aripiprazole binds stronger to the dopamine receptor than even haloperidol, even though it's a partial agonist rather than a antagonist or a blocker at D2. Aripiprazole does not just bind to dopamine receptors, it also binds to some serotonin subtype receptors. So it's a 5-HT1A, 5-HT just means serotonin, 1A is the subtype, so it's a 5-HT1A partial agonist. And 5-HT1A agonism can have a few effects, but 5-HT1A agonism in clozapine has been shown to increase dopamine levels in the prefrontal cortex, the front part of the brain. And this can be beneficial in the cognitive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Aripiprazole is also a 5-HT2A antagonist, 
and 5-HT2A binding acts like the brakes for dopamine release in certain areas of the brain. So blocking this receptor is blocking the brakes and letting dopamine be released in areas like this um, um, nigrostriatal pathway, which can contribute to some of the movement disorders or movement side effects you can see from, from um, blocking dopamine. Aripiprazole is also a 5-HT7 antagonist, which may have some antidepressant effects and some procognitive effects, so helpful for things like memory and that sort of thing. Aripiprazole has little affinity at histamine receptors, which may make it less sedating than some other antipsychotics. It has no, affini no affinity at M1 muscarinic receptors, so it will not cause many, many or any anticholinergic side effects. The next section I wanted to talk about is very important, and it's side effects. We will start with black box warnings. This is when there's a literal black box in the package insert of the medication because certain things, uh, certain side effects need to be highlighted and thought about before the medication is prescribed. Aripiprazole has two things in its black box for the black box warnings. First is antipsychotics as a class have a warning against their use in elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis. And this is due to an increased risk of death is seen in this patient population. So elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis, these medications should not be prescribed unless if there's a really serious reason why they are being prescribed, such as the patient is being violent, um, the patient is hurting themselves, the patient's being uh, sexually assaultive towards staff, towards other people, anything like that. Not minor reasons. The next part in the black box warning is a class warning for antidepressant medications, and this is increased risk of suicidal thinking and behavior in children, adolescents, and young adults taking antidepressants. So this is important to note as well because antidepressants as, as a class have been shown to have increased suicidal thinking not suicide attempts though, in patients age 24 or younger. Same risk was not seen for patients age 25 and up. So it's an important warning and it's an important thing to know about and talk about with your patients. Um, next, we will go into the warnings and precautions. So these are some serious side effects that are highlighted in the package insert that can occur with the medication. So we'll start with neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So this is another class effect of antipsychotics, and antipsychotics can rarely cause a potentially fatal side effect called neuroleptic malignant syndrome, shortened to NMS. NMS consists of high temperature, muscle rigidity, mental status changes, and autonomic instability, such as pulse changes, blood pressure changes. And like I said, it can be fatal. It is very rare, and incidence can be as low as 0.02% and I've been working in psychiatry for about six years at this point, and I have seen it once, I believe, once or twice in my career. So it's, it's, it's pretty rare, but it's a very serious side effect. And hospitals have to have a medication in stock called dantrolene that is commonly used to treat this and some other um, syndromes as well. The next thing in the things in the warnings and precautions of the package insert is tardive dyskinesia. So antipsychotics can cause a, move, a movement disorder called tardive dyskinesia, or TD. TD is characterized by involuntary movements, especially commonly seen in the mouth and the tongue, though it can be seen, these movements can be seen anywhere. The risk of TD is three times lower in the second generation antipsychotics compared to the first generation antipsychotics. But that being said, there are case reports of aripiprazole causing TD. So this is a potential side effect, although rare, with aripiprazole. Next is metabolic changes. So antipsychotics as a class, and especially the second generation antipsychotics, are known to cause some potential metabolic changes. Metabolic changes mean changes in um, blood sugar, changes in cholesterol, and changes in weight. Compared to many other of the second gen antipsychotics, aripiprazole has a lower risk to cause these changes. 
So hyperglycemia and dyslipidemia was mostly comparable to placebo, so I wanted to highlight or focus on weight gain. So in adult patients, there wasn't a ton of weight gain seen with aripiprazole, but there is some, so it's important to note with your patients. So for example, in the indication of schizophrenia, weight gain was seen in 8.1% of patients on Abilify and only 3.2% of patients on placebo. So that risk of weight gain is there. That being said, in bipolar, um, in bipolar mania, the placebo had more weight gain than aripiprazole. But in major depressive disorder, the aripiprazole, again, had more weight gain than placebo. So depending on the condition, there may be some weight gain in adults. Pediatric patients are different than adult patients, and they have a lot more weight gain with aripiprazole. So even though it's generally thought of as being mostly metabolically neutral, it's certainly not considered that way in pediatric patients. So for um, schizophrenia and bipolar in pediatric patients, the weight gain risk is 5% in aripiprazole and 1% in placebo. So it does cause more. But when you look at autistic disorder, when it's used for irritability and that, um, in autistic disorder, and when it's used for Tourette's disorder, the weight gain percentage is 20% and up um, for the pediatric indications, whereas the placebo groups had 7% weight gain. So just to summarize the point I'm trying to make is there's a, a little bit of weight gain in adults, but it's definitely more common in pediatric patients and also can change based on the um, condition being treated. Next, let's look at uh, the next warning, which is pathologic gambling and other compulsive behaviors. So when we talked about the mechanism, we said that this is a dopamine partial agonism, so agonist. So that can increase dopamine levels in certain areas of the brain, including the reward pathway. So um, post-marketing reports showed that aripiprazole may be associated with compulsive behaviors, things like gambling, things like sexual activity, things like compulsive shopping, and so on. In some of these cases, um, when the aripiprazole was stopped, the compulsive behaviors went away. In other cases, they weren't, they didn't go away, so it probably wasn't caused by the medication. This is not a side effect seen with most other antipsychotics, so this is more unique to aripiprazole because of its mechanism. But brexpiprazole, which I mentioned before, also does have this warning. Next is orthostatic hypotension. So aripiprazole can cause blood pressure changes and dizziness. Orthostatic hypotension was seen in 1% of patients with aripiprazole compared to 0.3% of placebo-treated patients. So this is higher than placebo. Next is falls. So as you would imagine, changes in blood pressure and the potential to cause dizziness can increase the risk for falls, which can be a serious side effect. So depending on the age of the patient, if an elderly patient falls, they can break a bone or get hurt, or really anyone who falls can break a bone or get hurt. The next warning to mention is leukopenia, neutropenia, and agranulocytosis. So some antipsychotics and many medications can cause changes in white blood cell count, um, changes in other parts of the CBC, which stands for complete blood count. This isn't a common side effect, but it's still something that should be monitored and looked at. So. Um, generally, people on most antipsychotics have a CBC, uh, a lab of their blood drawn at least once per year to check for these things. Finally, um, seizures are a risk with certain antipsychotics. Antipsychotics can lower the seizure threshold, and this is a rare side effect with aripiprazole, but it is possible. So 0.1% of patients treated with aripiprazole had seizures. The final major warning that we'll discuss is the potential for cognitive and motor impairment. So aripiprazole, even though it doesn't bind to histamine much, can be sedating in some people. Somnolence was seen in 11% of aripiprazole-treated patients compared to 6% of placebo-treated patients. So what you should tell your patients is they shouldn't drive, operate machinery, uh, do anything that requires coordination and mental, mental cognition until they know how aripiprazole affects them. 
So even though 11% get that side effect, that means just under 90% don't get that side effect. Next, outside of the major warnings, I just wanted to do a brief talk or a brief review of the common side effects. The most common adverse reactions in adult patients in clinical trials treated with aripiprazole, so this means greater than 10%. So that being said, often this number is somewhat high in placebo, so it's an important to note the difference between placebo and the medication in and of itself. But the most common adverse effects in adult patients greater than 10% were nausea, vomiting, constipation, headache, dizziness, a side effect called akathisia, which is this feeling of internal restlessness, anxiety, insomnia, and restlessness in and of itself. The most common uh, adverse reactions in the pediatric clinical trials, so again, greater than 10%, were somnolence, headache, vomiting, extrapyramidal disorder, which is movement disorders, fatigue, increased appetite, insomnia, nausea, nasopharyngitis, and weight gain. So the side effects um, can happen with aripiprazole. They're important to note and they're important to let your patients know about before this is the medication that is decided upon. So that wraps up what I wanted to say about side effects. Let's go on to the evidence per indication. Now I want to discuss the evidence per indication so we can see how effective aripiprazole is at treating various conditions. We'll start with what it was first FDA approved for in 2002, which is schizophrenia. So the first trial I wanted to discuss and look at was aripiprazole compared to a first generation antipsychotic. So I wanted to see how it compared to an older antipsychotic. So I wanted to look at an older study published in 2002, so the time it was approved. This study included 414 patients with a diagnosis of schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder who had failed an antipsychotic medication other than clozapine. Patients were randomly assigned to one out of four groups, aripiprazole 15, aripiprazole 30, haloperidol 10, or placebo. Treatments were given after breakfast for four, week, four weeks, and a scale called the PANS scale or the PAN score was used to track symptoms. PAN stands for positive and negative syndrome scale, I believe is what it stands for, but it tracks both the, both the positive symptoms of schizophrenia and the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. The PAN's decreases were as follows. So in the placebo group, the PAN score decreased by 2.9, so stayed relatively the same, which you would expect because the placebo isn't going to affect the brain chemistry. Next, aripiprazole 15 decreased the PAN score by 15.5, aripiprazole 30 decreased the score by 11.4, and haloperidol 10 milligrams decreased the score by 13.8. So the antipsychotic medications did what they were supposed to do and decreased the PAN score. The side effects that had the biggest difference from placebo were in the aripiprazole group were headache, anxiety, insomnia, nausea, dizzying, dizziness, vomiting, and somnolence. So the next thing I wanted to assess or look at is, is this 11 to 15 point difference clinically significant? So a lot of the studies will um, show data that is statistically significant, meaning that you're seeing a mathematical difference, but does that really matter to your patient? Will your patient be much better off? So there's ways to look at that with the scales, but I was able to find a study that looked at this and they determined that the minimum difference in PAN score that's clinically significant is estimated to be 15 points. So the aripiprazole 15 milligrams was just over that at 15.5, meaning that this difference was clinically significant and the patients probably would be better off with this improvement in their PAN score. So we saw that Aripiprazole is at least comparable to a first-generation antipsychotic called haloperidol. Next, I wanted to see how it would fare against a, another second-generation antipsychotic. So the next study included 404 patients who were randomly assigned to receive aripiprazole 20 milligrams, aripiprazole 30 milligrams, 
risperidone 6 milligrams, or placebo for four weeks. Participants in this study had to have a previous response um, to an antipsychotic other than clozapine. So let's look at the PAN score decreases again. Placebo, minus 5. Aripiprazole 20, minus 14. Aripiprazole 30, minus 13.9. Risperidone 6, minus 15.7. So um, this showed that aripiprazole wasn't quite as effective as the risperidone, um, but it was close. So in the 20 milligram group, it was 14.5 as compared to 15.7. So just over a point difference between the two. Next thing to note is that 17% in the placebo group discontinued treatment due to side effects, 8% in the risperidone group, 11% in the aripiprazole 20 group, and 8% in the aripiprazole 30 group. So the placebo group actually had the highest discontinuation rate in this, in this study due to side effects, which is interesting to note. Side effects were common in all four groups though. 91% of the aripiprazole 20 group uh, 91% of the aripiprazole 30 group, 93% of the risperidone group, and 86% in the placebo group noted some side effect. So that could be something really minor, and it was in many of the patients because they didn't discontinue, discontinue treatment, but it could be more severe side effects as well. The side effects that had the bigger, biggest difference from placebo were headache, vomiting, and akathisia, which again is that internal feeling of restlessness. So now that we saw that aripiprazole is mostly comparable to the first gen and other second gen antipsychotics, I wanted to see which dose or what particular dosing strategy of aripiprazole was most effective in schizophrenia. So I found a trial that did look at this. It compared different doses of aripiprazole in the um, treatment of acute exacerbations of schizophrenia. The patients were given either two milligrams 5 milligrams, 10 milligrams, or placebo for six weeks. So lower dosing than what's commonly recommended for schizophrenia. The PANS de decreases were as follow. Placebo, minus 5.3. Aripiprazole 2, minus 8.2. Aripiprazole 5, minus 10.6. Aripiprazole 10, minus 11.3. So remember in the other trials we looked at, when we, want, when we went to aripiprazole 15, aripiprazole 20, we were getting around the minus 15 dosing range. So this study shows that the higher doses are a little more effective in treating schizophrenia as compared to the lower doses, and this is reflected in the package insert. So we know it works for short-term treatment. Next is to look at how effective is it in the long term. The next study is a 52-week extension to a 26-week multi-centered randomized trial in patients with chronic schizophrenia. The patients were on aripiprazole 15 to 30 per day or another second-gen antipsychotic called olanzapine 10 to 20 per day. The PANS decreases um, were as follows in stable patients, aripiprazole minus 7, olanzapine minus 7. And then in unstable patients, aripiprazole minus 31, olanzapine minus 29. So again, showing in the long-term use, it was just as effective in unstable and stable patients as compared to olanzapine, which is known to be a pretty effective second-generation antipsychotic. Aripiprazole had less EPS, extrapyramidal symptoms, as compared to olanzapine, so 10% versus 18% and olanzapine caused more weight gain than aripiprazole. So what this trial showed was aripiprazole was effective in the long-term control of schizophrenia with less EPS and weight gain than olanzapine. So now I wanted to get into another topic in schizophrenia, which is adding antipsychotics together. It's called antipsychotic polypharmacy. Can aripiprazole be added to other antipsychotics? So first, I wanted to look at the least controversial treatment, which is adding aripiprazole to clozapine. So clozapine augmentation, clozapine is considered the most effective antipsychotic, and augmenting clozapine is in the guidelines if clozapine isn't completely effective. So the first study took place in Seoul, Korea, with only 62 patients. The patients were on clozapine treatment for at least one year, and they were on a stable dose for at least eight weeks and they were taking at least 400 milligrams of clozapine daily 
um, unless they had side effects. So basically saying they were on this medication for a while at an adequate dose, adequate duration. Um, patients were then randomly assigned to eight weeks of aripiprazole between five and 30 milligrams or placebo and the brief psychiatric rating scale was used to assess efficacy and the aripiprazole group decreased the BPRS by 5.1 points and the placebo decreased it by 4.7. So not much of a difference. But uh, one trial in one small study isn't enough to form a conclusion. So I did look at another study that found a benefit of adding aripiprazole to patients already taking clozapine. This was an even smaller study than the first one with only 27 participants. Patients were on clozapine 100 to 900 milligrams a day for at least 12 months, and they were assigned to receive aripiprazole 15 daily for 16 weeks. The total PANS decreased from 74.7 to 60.3 at the end of the 16 weeks. This conflicting evidence makes it difficult to know which patients would benefit from the addition of aripiprazole to clozapine but to know that there is the potential that it will be beneficial, but also there's the potential that it won't be. So that's what uh, this evidence seems to show with aripiprazole in conjunction to clozapine. But next, I wanted to look at what would happen if you add it to other second generation antipsychotics. So I found a study that added aripiprazole 2 to 15 milligrams or placebo to patients with an inadequate response to risperidone or Seroquel which are two different second-generation antipsychotic medications. The PANS decreased by 8.8 .8 in the aripiprazole group and 8.9 in the placebo group. So it wasn't shown to be an effective adjunct to other second-generation antipsychotics, at least in this study. Finally, it's thought that aripiprazole can sometimes be added to other antipsychotics, not to help with the efficacy, but to prevent some of the weight gain. So I wanted to comment on that. Finally, it is thought that aripiprazole may prevent the weight gain caused by other antipsychotics. So I found a small study of 16 patients stable on olanzapine for at least one month, and they were given the addition of aripiprazole 15 or placebo to see if weight would be affected. The placebo's group weight increased by 2.1 pounds over the course of the study, while the aripiprazole's group weight decreased by 2.9 pounds. So there is some potential benefits to preventing some of the weight gain from the other antipsychotics. Though this is a 16 person, person trial, so it's small and we need more evidence to um, completely conclude this. Next, I wanted to look at what the difference was between the two long acting injectable versions in schizophrenia because they both have an approval, an approval for schizophrenia. That being said, Abilify Maintena also has an approval for bipolar disorder but Aristata does not and only has the schizophrenia approval. So let's compare how effective each one was. So um, on the website of each of these medications, there's trials that they highlight. So I pulled these trials to take a look at them. In the Abilify Maintena trial, um, the patients had an initial PAN score of 103. 12 weeks into treatment, the average PAN score decreased by 27.2 points which again is clinically significant, and that's the decrease that was seen. In the Aristata trial, the baseline PAN score was 92, and 12 weeks into the treatment, the PAN score decreased by around 21 points. So it's not exactly comparing apples to apples because the patients in the Abilify Maintena trial had higher initial scores, so they were more sick, and they had more room to improve, so maybe that's why we saw that difference. Um, that being said, Abilify Maintena has some advantages, such as also being approved for bipolar disorder and potentially being more efficacious with the PAN score decreasing more. But Aristata has some advantages as well, such as the option to dose every two months and the option to give Aristata initio and bypass the oral overlap. So uh, we had a lot to go over with aripiprazole for schizophrenia, but I hope that little literature review and data that I presented was helpful in understanding its use in schizophrenia a little bit better. Next, I wanted to go into another indication that aripiprazole has, which is bipolar disorder, more specifically bipolar mania. 
First, I wanted to look at mania monotherapy, meaning just one medication used to treat mania. I found a study that compared aripiprazole 15 to 30 milligrams per day with placebo or another medication used in um, bipolar mania called lithium, 900 to 1500 milligrams per day. The Young Mania Rating Scale was used to assess efficacy and a 6.6 um, score decrease in the Young Mania Rating Score is considered to be clinically significant. So that's the goal we have when we look at this study. A Young Mania Rating Scale difference was seen between the placebo and aripiprazole group at day two. So a pretty quick, in, um, a pretty quick difference. The aripiprazole score decreased by 4.3, while the placebo decreased by 2.8. So again, it's not at that 6.6 um, decrease we're looking for, but that was just two days into treatment. So the aripiprazole score already decreased by 4.3. At week three, the aripiprazole um, group decreased the score by 12.6, the lithium group by 12, and the placebo group by nine. So all clinically significant. At week 12, 56.5% of the aripiprazole group had responded to the medication, while um, 49% had responded to the lithium. Over the 12-week study, side effects um, higher than 10% in the aripiprazole group were as follows. Headache, 23.4%. Nausea, 22.7%. Akathisia, 14.9%. Sedation, 13%. And constipation, 10.4%. So again, it's important to compare the side effects in the medication group with the side effects in the placebo group because you'll still see high numbers of some of these side effects even in the placebo group. Next to Cochrane Review, combine 10 studies with over 3,000 patients to get a bigger picture of aripiprazole's efficacy in treating bipolar mania. A high dropout rate of over 20% may have affected the estimate of efficacy. That being said, the dropout rate was similar in the placebo group. So there was just a high dropout rate all around. Aripiprazole beat placebo by 3.66 points on the Young Mania rating scale at three weeks, but no statistical difference was seen at six weeks. So really interesting Cochrane review to look at there. Compared with placebo, aripiprazole caused more movement disorders, GI disturbances, and um, constipation. Additionally, it caused more children slash adolescents to have a prolactin level that fell below the lower limit of normal. Normally with antipsychotics, we're worried about increased prolactin level, but aripiprazole can cause the opposite. So we looked at aripiprazole as monotherapy for bipolar disorder. Next, I wanted to look at adding aripiprazole to another mood stabilizer, such as lithium or Depakote. So I found a study that did just this. Um, patients were on either lithium or Depakote, and they were added to their regimen, either aripiprazole or placebo. This study looked at relapse rates, so patients relapsing into symptoms of bipolar mania. Relapse rates were 17% in the aripiprazole group and 29% in the placebo group. So this study showed that um, this study showed that continuing aripiprazole prevented people patients from having a relapse of symptoms. The most common side effects in the aripiprazole group um, compared to placebo were headache, 13% in the aripiprazole group compared to 10% in the placebo group, weight increase, 9% in the aripiprazole group compared to 6.6 .6 in the placebo group, tremor, 6% in the aripiprazole group compared to 2.4% in the placebo group, and insomnia, which was 5.4% um, versus 9.6% in the placebo group. Next, I wanted to look at treatment for the other side of bipolar disorder. So we looked at bipolar mania, which Abilify is FDA approved for, but you may have noted that it is not approved for bipolar depression. That being said, it has been used off-label, and let's look at these studies and look at these trials to see if it can be used for bipolar depression. So the first study was two identically designed eight weeks randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials and a depression score called the MADRIS or Montgomery Asperg rating scale was used to assess the efficacy. Aripiprazole was dosed between five and 30 milligrams and at week eight, there was not a statistically significant difference compared to placebo. Not only that, but the dropout rate was very high. 
So in study one, the dropout rate for aripiprazole versus placebo was 46.8% in the aripiprazole group versus 35% in the placebo group. In study two, it was 41.2% in the aripiprazole group and 29.8% in the placebo group. Another study confirmed aripiprazole's efficacy in bipolar mania, but showed that aripiprazole was not superior to placebo for preventing depressive episodes at 26 and 100 weeks of maintenance therapy. So what we've seen with bipolar disorder is that aripiprazole can be efficacious as monotherapy, can be help, really helpful as an adjunct medication to lithium or Depakote, but is not helpful in preventing relapses into bipolar depression. Although aripiprazole does not seem to be effective in treating bipolar depression, it does seem effective in treating major depressive disorder as an add-on medication. So it's important to note that bipolar depression and unipolar depression or major depressive disorder are distinct in differing illnesses. So there are differences here. First, let's look at aripiprazole adjunct versus placebo in treating depression. So this means the patient's already on a medication. In this case, they were on an SSRI antidepressant or an SNRI, and they were looking to see if adding aripiprazole to this was helpful and improved their response or if it didn't change their response. So these patients had either two to 20 milligrams of, ar of aripiprazole added or placebo added to their drug regimen. The MADRAS score decreased in the aripiprazole group by 10.1 and only by 6.4 in the placebo group. So this study concluded that adjunctive aripiprazole was associated with a two-fold higher remission rate than adjunctive um, placebo, and it's an effective add-on medication for depression. So now we know that aripiprazole beats placebo as an adjunct medication in treating depression, but let's see how it compares to adding another adjunctive antidepressant, so a more fair fight. The next study compared adding aripiprazole 2.5 to 20 milligrams per day versus bupropion 150 to 300 milligrams per day on patients who are unresponsive to SSRI monotherapy. So what this study means is the patients were on an SSRI antidepressant monotherapy and they didn't completely respond to the drug regimen. So they wanted to see if adding bupropion or adding aripiprazole, would, which one would be more effective as a treatment regimen. Participants were at least moderately um, to severely depressed after four weeks of the SSRI treatment. At week six, the remission rate was 55.4 in the aripiprazole group compared to 34% in the bupropion group. So this study shows that aripiprazole may be more effective than other add-on medications in treating unipolar depression. A study reviewed the efficacy of adding aripiprazole 2 to 15 milligrams versus switching antidepressants completely. Um, the MADRAS score decreased by 16.3 points in the aripiprazole group and by 7.6 in the switch group, showing a significant um, favorability of adding adjunctive aripiprazole versus switching regimens completely. Next, I wanted to review aripiprazole in treating treatment-resistant depression. So sometimes medications don't work for people. Once a person fails a medication um, and they're taking it at an adequate dose for an adequate duration, they are considered treatment-resistant. A small retrospective um, chart review of 30 patients who had failed an antidepressant and one atypical antipsychotic showed that 14 out of 30 patients were very much improved or very much improved once starting aripiprazole. A 46.7% response rate doesn't seem that high, but it still may be a useful tool in treatment-resistant depression, which, as the name implies, can be resistant to different medications. So it is a potential tool in treatment-resistant depression. Finally, with depression, I wanted to touch on suicidality. So suicidality is a difficult symptom to treat. In fact, uh, antidepressants have a black box warning for increased risk of suicidal behavior and thoughts in those 24 years old or younger, like we mentioned before. We only have two medications that have consistently showed to sh have been shown to decrease suicidality, those being clozapine and lithium. So a small study did look at aripiprazole in regards to suicidality. 
A post hoc analysis demonstrated that adjunctive aripiprazole treatment in depression did decrease suicidality in a certain subset of patients. So there is the potential that aripiprazole may have slight suicidality benefits in those age 25 or older. Next, let's look at aripiprazole in treating irritability associated with autistic disorder. So there are only two medications approved by the FDA to treat behaviors associated with autism, and aripiprazole is one of them. The other medication is also a second-generation antipsychotic called risperidone. So first, let's look at aripiprazole compared to placebo. So the first trial looked at 218 children and adolescents aged 6 to 17 with a diagnosis of autism, and they were randomized to receive either aripiprazole 5 milligrams, aripiprazole 10 milligrams, aripiprazole 15 milligrams, or placebo. The patients in this trial had behaviors such as tantrums, aggression, or cell and or self-injurious behaviors. The decrease in scores can be um, seen as follows. So the aripiprazole 5 milligram group decreased the aberrant behavioral checklist scores by 12.4 points, aripiprazole 10 by 13 points, aripiprazole 15 by 14 points, in the placebo group by eight. So this trial concluded that aripiprazole was effective and generally well tolerated with sedation being the most common reason to stop in this patient population. Next, I wanted to look at aripiprazole compared to the other medication approved for this indication, risperidone, to see if one had an advantage over the other. So a trial looked at this, 59 children were randomized to receive either risperidone or aripiprazole for two months. The aberrant behavior checklist, ABC, was used to assess changes in behaviors. The mean dose of aripiprazole was 5.5 milligrams and risperidone was 1.12 milligrams per day. The safety and efficacy was deemed to be comparable um, between the two medications. So a clear benefit or a clear leader wasn't seen between the risperidone or aripiprazole. So either or can be chosen based on the individual patient, potential side effects you're trying to avoid, and so on. Next, I wanted to look at the long-term efficacy. So not just in the short term, trying to help with the aggression and the self-injurious behaviors, but does this help over a long period of time? So I found um, two trials that looked at this. The first study had two phases. In phase one, aripiprazole was dosed between two to 15 milligrams for 13 to 26 weeks. If the patients responded, and a response was defined as a 25% decrease in their ABC score, they could move on to phase two. In phase two, the patients were either continued on aripiprazole or switched to placebo and continued until relapse um, of irritability of symptoms up to 16 weeks. Relapse rates at, six, at week 16 were 35% in the aripiprazole group and 52% in the placebo group though this was determined to not be statistically significant. Next, there was a 52-week open-label flexible dosing, 2 to 15 milligrams for the aripiprazole, and new participants in the study had an 8-point decrease in their ABC score, while continuing patients maintained their score decreases for the entire 52 weeks. So there may be these long-term improvements, long-term benefits, though compared to placebo, it, again, it wasn't statistically significant in that first trial. Next, I wanted to look at which behaviors actually improved. So looking at the ABC, um, the, the, the ABC score, there's individual symptoms within there, and I wanted to analyze or look at which symptoms actually improved. So a study broke this down, and it found that the following specific symptoms had significant improvements with aripiprazole, that being it prevented mood from changing quickly, it prevented crying and screaming inappropriately, and it uh, um, prevented the stamping of feet and the banging of objects. Finally, I wanted to look at the efficacy of aripiprazole for Tourette's disorder. Only a few antipsychotics are FDA approved to treat Tourette's disorder. Haloperidol and Pimazide are the first generation approved options, and Pimazide causes a lot of QTC prolongation, so it's not commonly used. So there's only a few medications that have this approval, and aripiprazole stands alone as the only second generation antipsychotic. So I wanted to look at a study that looked at aripiprazole versus placebo for Tourette's disorder. 
This study recruited patients aged 7 to 17 from 76 sites in four countries. Patients were randomized to three groups, low-dose aripiprazole, and their dose was 5 to 10 milligrams depending on their weight, or high-dose aripiprazole, and their dose was 10 to 20 milligrams depending on their weight, or placebo for eight weeks. And the primary endpoint was to look at the changes in a scale called the Yale Global Tick Severity Score. Um, and what this study found was 69% of patients in the low-dose group and 74% of patients in the high-dose group were marked as very much improved or much improved at the end of the trial compared to 38% in the placebo group. So it was um, doing much better than the placebo group, which is good to hear. The most common adverse events were sedation, 18.2% in the low-dose group, 8.9% in the high-dose group, and 2.3% in the placebo group. Somnolence, low-dose low 11.4, high-dose 15.6, placebo 2.3, and fatigue, 6.8 in the high-dose group, 15.6, um, sorry, 6.8 in the low-dose group, 15.6 in the high-dose group, and 0% in the placebo group. So this concludes my in-depth review of aripiprazole. So we went over the FDA-approved indications, we went over the mechanism of action, the side effects, including the black box warnings, and then we went over the evidence by indication. We started with schizophrenia, then did bipolar disorder, then did an adjunct in major depressive disorder, then did irritability associated with autistic disorder and finished with Tourette's disorder. Um, please feel free to click the link below to the website where you can see a written up, um, a rip, a written up version of this presentation. And I hope that this presentation was helpful. Thank you so much for watching.